Okay, welcome everybody. I think we're going to start. Um, we may be joined um, by other people coming in, but but that doesn't matter. We'll 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 get going to keep on time. Um, I'm delighted to have with me here today, Dr. Abe Bang, who um, I first met several years ago through the work, the collaborative work that we were doing together and continue to do together with Save the Children, and that the organisation that uh, Dr. Bang founded together with his wife. Uh, 26 years ago, an organization called SEARCH, which stands for the Society for Education, Action and Research in Community Health, um, in an in a, in a underdeveloped area in the state of Maharashtra. And um, Dr. Bang and his wife work with 120 villages um, to provide community-based health care, but also critically to do research. And they've developed a village health care program, which has <coughs> now become nationally and internationally famous model that has influenced healthcare policy both here in India and in many other countries around the world. And I think part of that is because of the power of the research that has all been documented in, in publications like the, the Lancet. So it's a very persuasive model, not only on the ground, but in, in terms of uh, being able to prove that it, that it really does work and it's affordable and, and can be scaled up. Um, Dr. Bang was also appointed as a member of the high-level expert group um, appointed by the Prime Minister here in India to prepare the blueprint of universal health care for India, um, and uh, may have some views on that if we have time, and um, was also um, anointed by Time magazine in 2005 as the global health hero. So he's certainly one of my heroes, um, and it's just a, a pleasure for me to be able to, to interview you. So, Dr. Bang, I wonder if you could start by telling us a little bit about how you've managed to achieve these quite startling breakthroughs in terms of reducing child mortality rates. Particularly interesting in the context here, we are hearing about how India is failing to, at the moment, be on track for its Millennium Development Goal 4 to reduce by two-thirds the number of children dying before their fifth birthday. And yet, you've been able to pioneer and prove a model that is bringing those rates down quickly. So can you tell us a little bit about what you've achieved and what you've learned? Thank you, Jasmine. It's not the first time that we are getting late in India in this room, but we are late in even achieving Millennium Development Goals. And the delay that would <coughs> happen in achieving MDG 4 would mean for India alone, two million excess child death. So delay is a major factor. As you said, mentioned earlier, the place where I work called Gadichiroli, we are more known in India because of the Maoist activity and the violence in our district. It's a remote district, very poor, tribal, covered with forests. And nearly 27 years ago, Rani, my wife, and I <coughs> decided to go there and started this organization, our own search, as you, as you mentioned. After a few initial blunders, we realized that a doctor or a researcher should not begin with what he thinks is needed, but must begin with what people think is needed. So we started organizing People's Health Assembly every year. And then people told us what research we should be conducting. So one of the first four priorities that they mentioned, women said, our children are dying. And around the same time, one very major but unfortunate thing happened, that on one rainy season night, two tribal women knocked on our home and uh, with a very sick ch child in hand. And Within two minutes that I could examine, child had pneumonia, dehydration, malnutrition, two-month-old child, and before I could do anything, the baby died. <laughs> now, this woman and this child had come only from, from a distance of four kilometers from our hospital. And I could still, from their history, from their story, I could count that there were 18 causes why this child died distance, poverty, illiteracy, no bridges, no doctors, etc., etc. How can we save these children if there are 18 causes pitted against those helpless children? So one solution that we could think of was if babies cannot come to hospital, hospital 
must go to where the babies were. And that's how this idea, which was later on named as home-based newborn and child care, that emerged. Why not train, if doctors are not willing to go to villages, why not train a literate village woman to become a newborn and child specialist of the village on the lines of barefoot doctor in China? And that's how we began first measuring child mortality, infant mortality rate, as you, <coughs> as you know, we, we measure the uh, child death rate or infant death rate. The IMR was 121 at that time. Pneumonia and newborn deaths were the most important causes of mortality. So we selected village women. We call them Arogya Dut, which literally means messengers of health or angels of health. So these village women who are trained and certified by search, they go from house to house, educate mothers about how to take care of health, of their own health, of baby's health. When the babies are born, they are present at the time of delivery, if it is home delivery. They start immediate breastfeeding. They take care of mother's health as well as baby's health. And then subsequently provide support to newborn baby. As, you, as we all know, the first one month of life of a human being is the riskiest period in human entire life. <clears throat> and uh, the risk of death is enormous. At that time, it was 60 newborn babies died within first one month out of the total 1,000 babies born. Mm. Some of them were sick also. Now again, no doctor would reach there. So we had to train this village worker, Arogya Dut, even to treat sick neonates which was considered a very bold thing, a lot of medical opposition. How can you train semi-literate women to provide treatment to newborn babies? The World mm -hmm. Health Organization used to say in those days, every sick newborn baby must be hospitalized. But there were no hospital within 300 kilometers of where we were working. This approach, we conducted a rigorous field trial, and it reduced newborn mortality rate by 70%. If newborn, reducing newborn mortality is considered a very difficult challenge, mm -hmm. so if you reduce by 5% in developed country, it becomes headline in newspapers and television. Here it was reduced by 70%, and in that area, remote, difficult, poor, illiterate, and still the infant mortality rate, because of these women and the health care provided through these women, IMR reduced from 121 to 30. And mere coincidence, but India chose that as the national goal subsequently to ah. reduce IMR to the level of 30 in the next 10 years. These women had achieved it ahead of the national goal. Now, this method we published in the Lancet. Lancet not only published, but later on selected this research as one of the vintage papers in the Lancet ever published in 180 years history. The main reason is that problem is not only local. Deaths of newborn babies and children, even today, even today, nearly 8 million children die world over every year. One and a half million die in India alone. So how to save them with the limitations of hospital-based approach? So this approach probably showed the way that no, these newborn babies need not die and they could be saved. With this global need, and the strong scientific evidence, it was picked up by journals, academicians, but also organizations like Save the Children. And through a very good shake hand of search and Save the Children, and later on with Government of India, this model was scaled up. So now this has become the national policy in India. Health Ministry has made a national program out of this. And ASHA is a new community health worker in India. 800,000 ASHAs are being trained in this Gadichili model. And how? This is the bag. This is really the power bag which is used to empower that village woman, community health worker. If you can see, there's a logo here. <laughs> that woman who is in that home with a baby in her hands, helpless, her baby could be sick, but you empower that woman with some knowledge, some training, and these equipments, and she can go from house to house, and she literally makes every home and hut, turns a home and hut into a 
newborn care intensive care unit because the results are so dramatic. So this has now become not only a national model in India, but nine countries are emulating it in different parts. And in 2009, WHO, UNICEF, USAID, and Save the Children came up with a global guidelines that in developing countries where there is no access to hospital-based care, this is the way to reduce newborn child mortality. So two questions following on from that great story. Um, you mentioned opposition from the from the established <coughs> medical profession. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Why wouldn't they want this to work? I mean, we're all working on the same things here. And my second question is, what's inside that power bank? <laughs> That's a secret. <laughs> Look, the medical opposition was not so much because of Western interest, because newborns in rural areas were nobody's Western interest. They were not providing business to anybody, so nobody was going to lose business by training community health worker. It was more... A medical mindset always says, believes that only doctors can deliver best care and nobody else should ever deliver health care. This was, in a way, sort of violating those norms. But I must admit that the pediatrics leadership in this country had been very generous. It, it looked at the evidence, it looked at the national need, and then subsequently pediatrics and neonatologist leadership of this country have vigorously supported this model. Now, this bag consists of few equipments and things which altogether cost not much really, just $30. But this is health education flip chart. We call it dialogue with mothers. This is almost like a knowledge vaccine. Using this, a mother can be educated by a community health worker as to how to take care of her own health. This is a warm bag. Babies who are preterm, low birth weight, or hypothermic, how to keep them warm at home in cold winter or in rainy season? They don't have electricity, they don't have heaters, there are no incubators. So this warm bag, like a sleeping bag, this keeps such babies warm. And then babies who are born at home, but who don't breathe immediately, they need immediate breathing support. If you don't provide them breathing support, Within next two minutes, they are dead. So this is called ambu bag, which is usually used by anesthetist for emergency oxygenation of patients who are unconscious. She is trained to use this and give breathing support to baby. This is the weighing scale. So there are some equipment which allow thermometer weighing scale, which allow examination of the newborn baby, and some which allow to take care of the baby and keep baby warm early breastfeeding, and then if it's sick, treat. And tell me a little bit more then about training these, as you say, illiterate women often in the village to be able to perform these functions. I've just come from the plenary session on missing women, and in fact one of the points that came through was the, the status of particularly rural women um, and, and how it's a problem on the one hand, but also potentially a huge opportunity. Tell me about you presumably see these women more of a, as an opportunity. T tell me about that. It's an enormous opportunity. And uh, the, the type of women who can reduce child mortality, a problem which some uh, government of India or society as a whole is unable to handle, and these women are able to handle. These women are mother, grandmother, traditional birth attendant, and this new worker, as I mentioned, messenger of health, or ASHA, now at the national level. <clears throat> she's from the same village. She's not brought from, brought from outside. So she's not posted there. She's not paid salary. She's selected okay. from the village. She's selected from the village. She's serving her own community. And she receives 26 days training. At the time of selection, we, we look for certain qualities, certain attributes, which is most important. Her literacy is not that important mm -hmm. as her attributes are. So we look for certain attributes. After 26 days training, this training is divided into multiple small parts. So every month she receives three days training okay. and then works in her own community. So her own community is practically her training laboratory where she weighs baby, she examines them, takes their temperature, talks to women, explains them, and that's how Gradually, over a period of one year, her skills are built up. She goes through rigorous evaluation. A supervisor visits her once in every 15 days. And then finally, when she passes that evaluation, 
the training method standardized that we have standardized in that we found that 92% of village Arogya Dut scored more than 70% marks. Here in India, I became doctor if I score more than 50%. But wow. for Arogya Dut, we have kept it a little higher. It has to be 70%. She's going to deal with sick babies. 92% Arogya Dut perform extremely well. So this method of training is now standardized. And as I said earlier, 800,000 ashras in India are being trained using this method to provide home-based newborn and child care at the doorstep in Indian villages. Well, that's very impressive. So you mentioned about when you, you became a doctor. Now, when you did become a doctor, what, what, what is it that made you decide to take this slightly alternative route rather than becoming a a highly paid consultant in a, in a hospital or perhaps go overseas. What, what, what inspired you to take this route and to dedicate your life to this, this area of research and development? It's a little long story, but I'll cut it short. Uh, nearly 65 years ago, my father, who was a professor of economics, and he taught in one of Mahatma Gandhi's college. So he wanted to go to the US for studying economics further. Before leaving for the U.S., he went to see Mahatma and then bowed to him, asked for his blessings. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi looked at him for just a few seconds and then said, if you want to study economics, go to the villages of India and not the U.S. Right there and then he tore away his travel documents, his admission papers in the oh. U.S., and within one month, he started with his students, he went and started living in a village. So when I finished my medical education, post-graduation, etc., etc., his words were still ringing in our ears. And commitment was that we must be able to provide health care to the villages of India. Unknown path, did not know how to do that, did not know even what the main problems were, and that's why when we went to Gadchiroli, then we thought that if we anyway want to do this, let's go to the place which is least served, which is the most difficult. If something works here, it ought to work everywhere in India. So we chose Gadchiroli. That's why we named our organization Search. We didn't have answer. We were not lights. We were searching in the dark. And the place we live, our headquarter campus that we have started there, we call it Shodha Gram. Indians here would understand the word quickly. Shodha means, again, search. So it's a search village, searching in darkness. Now, that's, what, that's how my journey is. Look, my childhood was spent in Mahatma Gandhi's ashram. And that ashram is called Seva Gram, which in Indian language means a village for service. So I started from Seva Gram and ended up founding Shodha Gram. And you were fortunate enough to find a wife who clearly wanted to achieve the same things in life as you. Well, we were classmates. We fell in love with each other mainly because we had similar dreams. How wonderful. <laughs> what a lovely story. So now tell me, um, at the World Economic Forum, as you know, one of the, the big sort of focus of, of discussions is around how multi-sector collaboration between you know, different types of organizations, government, businesses, and NGOs can work together. I believe you've got some thoughts in terms of how NGOs, organizations like Search, can work together, particularly with business. Can you, can you tell me about that? Look, for any collaboration, <clears throat> I believe that mere convenience is not enough. There must be matching of values and goals, and then subsequent practical issues. So the first thing which has to occur do the values and goals of corporate sector and NGOs match? That's a big question. And I think we must begin a little bit philosophically there. Because without that clarification, mere convenient working together won't last. Charles Handy, who I don't know whether he's still alive, but he, he was a very well-known management guru. He once beautifully said, he said that communism had a beautiful dream but he did not know methods how to bring that dream into reality. And then he said, capitalism has wonderful methods, but it has no dream. And if capitalism has no dream, then we'll have to invent. 
capitalism needs a soul it needs heart mm. later on as the corporate social responsibility came into vogue i think it's a very good beginning it's a very good beginning but there again that social responsibility remains peripheral for the corporation the main job is earning profit michael porter has recently written a cover story on harvard harvard business review and he has put forward this concept of shared value to quote his words he said we'll have to reform capitalism not only at the periphery but the very purpose of capitalism probably has to change and it has to become shared value so that the corporates and the people the customers as well as employees all they share similar value to take this little back i am very surprised but mahatma gandhi proposed something nearly 70 years ago which now michael porter and bill clinton and bill gates are echoing he said that look a corporation or company has to be run like a public trust a trustee of a public trust is dedicated he is committed he has passion he works very hard he or she but he doesn't own it actually modern corporations also are more or less run in a similar fashion the ceo or the managing director doesn't own that company but still he runs with dedication and passion so a little shift in the outlook that corporates corporations companies need to be run like a public trust then that immediately can it can reduce distance between ngos and corporates and both may share similar value and similar goal and there are n number of ways in which companies and ngos can work together on social problems we are talking a lot about india economic superpower or fantastic growth story etc etc but i am sure leader business leaders here very much realize that unless economic growth is accompanied by inclusive growth and also social growth the otherwise social problems can greatly undermine the economic story it's no, not only about economic growth issue it's also that health is a precondition for economic growth but more than that good health is the goal of growth why do we need money if you don't need health if you are not going to achieve health so health is not a means for economic growth it's an end for economic growth so how can we work together my all experience in this is in the field of health so naturally i'm going to take examples from the same field but one let me small start from a small thing as i said earlier this is the power bag and there are many such innovations and products which if scaled up through mm. social marketing mm. or through other ways which corporates would know better than i do but if they are scaled up and made available in large number mm. where they are needed that could very rapidly reduce so this bag for example at the moment is is put together by your own organization is it it's not as if one company is is uh contributing to create no actually we buy products from various other companies we assemble them yeah. and search looks for certain quality and search has good credibility so people really use it so it can be done by others as well mm. but my it's not we don't have any sort of patent on it mm. but my point is that this kind of power equipments which will empower people for self care for community based care so they don't, they don't have to wait for doctors and hospitals to either arrive or where they would never reach and so propagating this kind of products and solution in large number mm. that's where skills and resources of corporates could be enormously useful there are other ways in which they can help just for example S uh, providing service to one mother newborn and child in a village would cost in indian terms about 500 rupees per year 10 dollars per year wow so one mother one newborn one child and then depending on your economic willingness to offer one could adopt thousands of mothers newborns and children not feeding them yourself but empower them empower those village women to take care of mothers and newborn children in their own village so i would say multiply empowerment 
And then, of course, one could go even further. We have recently proposed model of universal health care for India at a very small cost, 0.5% of per capita GDP. At that cost, one can provide universal health care at the village level, which would mean about 4 lakh rupees per village per year, 400,000 rupees per village per year. And you can provide from self-care, health education, community-based care, and primary health care, and early secondary care. Everything can be provided at such smaller cost. So corporates can really join hands with NGOs, with the social sector, with organizations like Save the Children, so that we can multiply this process. Unless we achieve women's empowerment, unless we achieve knowledge, lit health literacy, and unless we achieve what I, I use a word from Indian languages, Arogya Swaraj, which, which literally means our health in our own hands. So we need to empower people for that. And that can only ensure that Indians are healthy, young people are healthy, that only can ensure economic growth. That's a very compelling vision. So. Uh, I'm assuming you're optimistic then in terms of um, now that the government has taken on and, and, and committed to this new rollout of, of the uh, breakthroughs that, that you have pioneered, um, that we, there is now a vision in place for universal health coverage. Um, you obviously have great ideas for how corporates can contribute to that. Are you optimistic that India is now going to get itself on the right path and perhaps catch up towards meeting its Millennium Development Goal to stop children dying before their fifth birthday? Well, India is certainly not going to achieve Millennium Development Goal by the year 2015. But I guess as far as the child mortality goal is concerned, we'll achieve it by, let's say, about 2020. So we'll be five years late, which would mean two and a half million excessive child deaths, which is unfortunately sad. But then there are many, many positive things happening in India. So even if we'll be late for Millennium Development Goals, but one thing I find is that education has empowered Indian women, girls and women to a large extent. The self-help group movement, especially in the southern part of India, up to Maharashtra, not so much to the north of Maharashtra, but in southern India up to Maharashtra, self-help group movement, and what Chavi was saying today, uh, the, this representation of women at the grassroots political institutions called Panchayat Raj institutions, these are silent changes occurring at the grassroots. You won't find much in the media. There is not much corruption in it. So there, is, there are no scandals. So it's not really flashed in the national headlines. But these are the changes which are going to change India. Let me mention two more things. One is youth, power of youth. And India is more endowed than any developed country as far as the power of youth is concerned. And the, the, if at all India will become superpower, that's not my dream, but I'm saying if at all India becomes economic superpower, it will be only because of the youth and women. And that's why, look, you can see my beard, my beard is gray now. So I know maybe after a few years, Rani and I may or may not be able to work, but we must create a new generation of young social change makers. So six years ago, we started a new organization called Nirman. Hmm. And Nirman really is trying to sensitize young professionals, youth from Maharashtra state to the social reality, social challenges, and trying to empower them and also encourage them to take up this as the mission. And nearly 50 youth in different parts of Maharashtra have already started working in different paths. So one solution at one level or only in Gadichuli is not enough. We need to multiply. Youth and education, these are the multiplicatory power. Now, I must mention in the end, but apart from the, what we read about poor governance and corruption in the politics, which are major, major threats for India's growth story, but something other disturbing emerging is non-communicable diseases. Indians are dying at a very fast rate at earlier age because of coronary heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, etc., etc. One reason is our unhealthy lifestyle. And another reason is consumption of tobacco hmm. on a very large number. 
a small district Gadchiroli with a population of only 1 million consumes 730 million rupees worth of tobacco every year. Look at the amount of economic loss plus the diseases that would create. So the changing lifestyle is a major threat to the health story of India. So we need to struggle on that front. But I am very optimistic, especially because of women and youth of India. It's wonderful to hear you present women and youth as the opportunity for, for India in terms of its growth and its future. And I think uh, I would certainly agree with that. And I think it's been coming through slowly, but I hopefully more powerfully in the sessions at the, the World Economic Forum more generally here in India. Um, that's been really fascinating. Um, you've, you've covered a, a very large uh, amount of ground in a, in a small amount of time. If there was just one thing that you wanted to leave with us, what would, the, what would that be? Well, when similar question was asked to Mahatma Gandhi, I'm just going to echo his words. So it's not my message. It's coming from him. And he said, be the change yourself that you want to see in the world. So all of us, whether social workers like me or corporates, must live the life that we wish, we want the future to become reality. And the reality starts happening. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Bang. It's been a, a pleasure Thanks. being here. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, everybody.